for time for question period, the Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you and uh, good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The response uh, to yesterday's shocking revelation from the Auditor General that this government has deliberately understated Ontario's deficit by $5 billion this year has been swift. The Ontario Chamber of Commerce issued a statement yesterday after the auditor affirmed Ontario actually has an $11.7 billion deficit. Wow. They wrote, quote, if the province of Ontario were a publicly held company, we as shareholders deserve and demand clarity and accountability from our board and our auditors. This is similarly our right as Ontarians. Speaker, business confidence in this government is shaken. Question. Is the Premier's re-election bid worth destabilizing investment confidence in Ontario? Well, you know, Mr. Speaker, I know that the minister um, responsible for the Treasury Board, the President of the Treasury Board, is going to want to comment on this. But, Mr. Speaker, in fact, the only reason that we are having this conversation is that this government, Mr. Speaker, introduced the Fiscal Transparency and Accountability Act, and therefore there is a pre-election report, Mr. Speaker. That's why we are having this conversation. So, you know, I think that uh, through the uh, through the pre-election report, the Office of the Auditor General's analysis, Ontarians are given the information that they need to make an informed decision, Mr. Speaker. The fact is there is an ongoing dispute between professional accountants. That is a reality. It's been going on for a couple of years, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. It is absolutely true that there is a disagreement yeah. between— I'm quite prepared to move immediately to warnings if I hear further outbursts. Uh, yes, they are outbursts. You're supposed to be quiet during question period, believe it or not and it's in the standing orders, and I'm going to fulfill them. Premier. Just to say, Mr. Speaker, it is an ongoing dispute between professional accountants. We recognize that. We Answer. respect the perspective of the Auditor General, but that dispute has been going on for a couple of years, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary. Terrible. Uh, back to the Premier. Well, no, oh. Speaker. We're having this conversation because the government continues to present an incorrect picture of the province's finances. The Ontario Chamber had even more to say. They wrote, quote, It is deeply concerning that the government of Ontario would be accused of not following Canadian public center, uh, sector accounting standards. Uh, speaker, when the Auditor General summed it up, she said, Quote, when expenses are understated, the perception is created that the government has more money available than it actually does, just in time for a pre-election budget. Yeah. How convenient. Wow. Speaker, the Premier needs to know the jig is up. Jig Will she up. admit the government's numbers are wrong? Of the Treasury Board. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member opposite for his question because it yeah. provides me with the opportunity to provide some much-needed context to this discussion, Speaker. First of all, again, I want to thank the Auditor General for her response to the pre-election report. We appreciate her work to ensure that the public received an independent assessment of our province's finances. And let me remind the House and the member opposite of something critically important. We pass legislation to do this, Speaker. So the notion that we aren't being transparent is not only factually incorrect, it risks sending a negative and inappropriate message to the people of Ontario, and that is exactly what, this, what they're doing, Speaker. They, they're not— they're The member from the P.N. Carleton is warned. Carry on. The members opposite, Speaker, want to continue to undermine confidence in our province and our, and our provincial institutions. That's up to them. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. Carry on. But here's precisely what the auditor said Answer. in case the member opposite missed it. The pre-election report provides a reasonable and somewhat cautious underpinning for the medium-term fiscal forecast. She said we were reasonable and cautious, and we stand Thank you. Final supplementary. 
Well, back to the Premier. Actually, uh, Speaker, we on this side of the House and the people of Ontario, they understand that it's the government who put the government at risk. No, nobody else, Speaker. The Auditor General's job is to state the true picture of Ontario's finances. Now, based on the Auditor's shocking revelation, here's more from the Ontario Chamber of Commerce. Quote, the government of Ontario, and through them the people of Ontario, uh, either respect our legislative officers or we do not. That is exactly why Ontario PC leader Doug Ford has committed a full audit of the government's books to restore responsibility, accountability and trust in government. Speaker, can the Premier tell us today what is the government of Ontario's? Minister of Finance is warned. Finish, please. Uh, can the Premier tell us today exactly what is the government of Ontario's deficit for 2018-19? Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, Speaker, listening to the rhetoric from the opposite side, let me just respond to something very important that the member opposite just said. Implicitly, the leader of the PC party, Doug Ford, is now questioning the Auditor General's competency, and I'll tell you why. He says that he's going to provide independent audits. Guess what that discounts, Speaker? Our professional and highly competent public servants, <laughs> our professional uh, Deputy Minister of the Treasury Board and the Deputy Minister of Finance that not only sign off on our fiscal plan, give us precisely the kind of advice and confidence in our book, Speaker, that we need. And by the way, when it comes to some of the issues that the Auditor General outlined in her report, we also had independent advice, Speaker, by some of the most credible accounting firms in the world. We stand by that, Mr. Speaker. We respectfully remind the member opposite that we have a respectful disagreement with the Auditor General. And once Answer. again, we thank her for her work. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Auditor General was clear. The government's deficit numbers are off by $5 billion this year, $5.5 billion next year, and $6 billion off, almost 100 per cent off the following year. Those revealed deficits are projected to grow to a total of $16.6 billion over the next three years. Now, we now know that in their desperation, the Premier and this government have betrayed the public's trust. That's why our leader, Doug Ford, has today promised that when elected, we will launch an independent commission of inquiry. This new commission will get to the bottom of the Liberal deficit scandal and properly and propose timely solutions to solving the deficit problem. Question. Speaker, why does it always take the OPP, the Auditor General, or an investigative commission to get to the truth with this Premier? You see it, please. Thank you, Premier. President of the Treasury Board. The Treasury Board. Speaker, you know um, it's troubling, to, in the to say the least, the member opposite would conflate a respected opinion of an independent officer of this legislature with motive or intent. As the spouse of a former OPP officer, I can tell you clearly, Speaker that this is not about that. What this is about, and we said it yesterday, is a couple of things. Number one, reminding the public of the confidence that's necessary in our public institution and not undermining those, which is precisely what the member opposite is doing. Second, we thank the Auditor General for her service, and we respectfully remind this House and the Ontario public that we have a difference of opinion, and that is a respectful difference of opinion, Speaker, and it will remain so because we are committed to, to seeking professional advice from professional accountants we did that, but we also have a highly respected public service. The member opposite Answer. diminishes that when he talks about the credibility of our work, Speaker, Great and true. our work as a provincial government. True. Thank you, Mr. Great Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you. Back to the Premier. This is not about a difference of opinion, Speaker. This is about desperation. desperation. We cannot trust anything this Liberal government ever estimates or projects again. Their budget is no longer worth the paper it was printed on. The people of this province are angry and they want answers. Doug Ford and the Ontario PCs are going to get those answers. It took 15 years for the Liberals to create this mess and it will not be resolved overnight. 
but we will restore Ontario to fiscal health in a responsible manner. Yeah. Speaker, I'll ask the Premier one more time. Why does it always take the OPP, the Auditor General, or an investigative commission Question. to get to the truth with this Premier and this Thank government? You. You it, you it, Thank you. Minister of Finance. Treasury Board. Speaker, the Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite now wants to do an audit of the auditor. The minister, the, the member opposite, I'm not sure what independent auditing team they intend to use. Is it KPMG? Is it Deloitte? Is it ENY? Or is it Dougie Ford that's going to go out there and look at the books, Mr. Speaker? He did that already. The city of Toronto. Let me be clear. Stop the clock. Regardless if the member has status in the House or not, I would ask all members that this is not the time to be disrespectful in this House to anyone, and I would ask your indulgence to use proper names and, in this House, titles or writings. Minister. Speaker, the Auditor General does make clear that the pre-election report does provide a reasonable and cautious underpinning of those fiscal forecasts that we made. The Auditor General only reflects on two issues, and they've been the same two issues for the past number of years. Exactly. It's the reflection of pension assets, which the Auditor General feels we should actually discount, but every other auditor, including herself in the past, has agreed with. Yeah. Yeah. And the second one is a fair hydro plan, which these independent, world-renowned accounting firms have prepared. She says it's not wrong to actually do this kind of rate regulation. Thank she you. doesn't like it, and that's not our. Thank you. Final supplementary. Premier, the Auditor General told us yesterday in her news conference that when you get pushback from the government, like she's getting, that's the time for Ontario to worry, Speaker. Yep. And now it's obvious to everyone in Ontario how this election document the Liberals tabled was a 100 per cent sham. None of the care promises were included in the budget legislation. Only the tax increases made it in. Speaker, this Premier can never be trusted again. But I tell the people of Ontario that help is on the way. Doug Ford and the Ontario PCs, we will deliver our commitments, clean up the scandals and the waste, and protect the services that people of Ontario deserve. And we will not quit until we have restored responsibility, account. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. Minister of Labour is warned. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite is claiming that they are not going to help the people of Ontario. They're going to cut programs for the people of Ontario. They're going to cut the services, cut the investments, and cut the ability to us to, for Ontario to be strong and continue to grow. So, Mr. Speaker, dated April 24th, a couple of days ago, by a rating agency, and this is what they said, DBRS Limited says this. The province of Ontario has and respectively has confirmed Ontario's electricity, financial, corporation, long-term obligations, as well as the province's rating as AA. The trend on all ratings are stable, including OPG, ISO, and the province of Ontario. They know what's going on, and they're supporting Ontario all the way, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Can the Premier explain to Ontarians why it was more important for her to have the lowest corporate tax rate in Canada than it was to fund hospitals and, and hallway medicine? Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, we believe that we have to be competitive and we have to provide services for people yeah. in this province, Mr. Speaker. That's actually the role of government. It's extremely important that 
business wants to be here, that job creation can happen. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, since I've been the Premier, 400,000 net new jobs have been created, Mr. Speaker, mostly in the private sector. So it's extremely important that those jobs are created because, Mr. Speaker, that is how the wealth of the province is created, and then we can make the investments in health care and education that are needed. And we have every year, Mr. Speaker, every budget, we have increased funding to health care, we have increased funding to education, Mr. Speaker, yeah. and we will continue to do so. One does not exist without the other. Answer. It's not possible to have an economy that doesn't include wealth creation and investment in its yeah. people, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Speaker, it's about sharing the wealth. That's the issue, Speaker, which is what the Liberals never have been able to figure out. The Premier's tax cuts have put money in the pockets of the wealthiest Ontarians and into the bank accounts of Ontario's most profitable corporations. Those dollars came out of hospitals and health care, Speaker, and the result is that we now have hallway medicine in Ontario. Does the Premier think that that's right? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I wonder when the NDP and you know they were on this uh, attack yesterday. I wonder when they stand up and basically argue that we should not be a competitive jurisdiction, nope. that we should find ways to be uncompetitive, Mr. Mr. Speaker. I wonder where they believe the funds come from to invest in health care, to invest in education. Mr. Speaker, there is an integral relationship between the ability of this province to create wealth, to create an environment where business can thrive, to create jobs. We're, in this province, Mr. Speaker, we are at a an unemployment yeah. low of 20 years, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Yeah. We have not had such low unemployment, and that's because jobs have been created. Yeah. It's because people can find Answer. jobs. It's because we're competitive. And at the same time, Mr. Speaker, we are making record investments in health care. Those two things go Thank together, you. Mr. Speaker. Well, Speaker, I do meet with chambers of commerce across Ontario, and over and over they tell me that businesses count on our health care system. It is one of our best competitive advantages. Hurting our health care system is actually bad for business. I have a plan to make our tax system fair. Corporate taxes will be below the national average, below states like California, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Connecticut, Wisconsin, but it will ask the wealthiest people and most profitable corporations to pay their fair share so that we can end hallway medicine, something that is in all of our interests, Speaker. Why doesn't the Premier get that? Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Of economic development and growth. Well, thanks very much, Speaker. As the Premier has said on repeated occasions in response to these kinds of questions from the NDP, we know that we have prosperity here in the province of Ontario because our Premier and our government continue to invest in our people, continue to invest in the core public services that the people of this province depend upon, including public health care, including public education, and also including making sure that we have a competitive tax regime in place so that the entire province can prosper, Speaker. That's been the focus of our work over the last number of years, and it will continue to be as we go forward because we know that we've had economic success, but we need the entire province to share in that prosperity and success, and that's what we are exclusively focused on. Thanks very much, Speaker. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Every dollar that the Premier hands to the wealthiest Ontarians comes from somewhere. Under this Premier, it came from hospitals. Four years of frozen budgets, Speaker. It's no wonder that there's a crisis in health care when the Premier refuses to have anyone pay for it. Why is the Premier more interested in tax cuts than fixing health care? Well, Mr. Speaker, again, um, you know, I, I believe that our health care system is uh, two things. It is the finest expression of our value system and our belief as a society that we have a responsibility to care for each other, Mr. Speaker. And it is also, as the, uh, as the uh, leader of the third party says, it is also a competitive advantage. She's absolutely right about that. And the reason it's a competitive advantage, Mr. Speaker, is that it is excellent. And so when I talk to businesses in other countries that are looking at Ontario and considering settling, uh, 
investing here, Mr. Speaker, or expanding their businesses here. They do look at our health care system. It is excellent, and the reason it is excellent, Mr. Speaker, is we have continued to invest in it. There are more nurses, Mr. Speaker. Our wait times are among the best in the country. We know that there's more to be done. We recognize that. There's $822 million in our budget, Mr. Speaker. There was $500 million last year just for hospitals to make sure that hospitals have the resources yes, that they need. But we have an excellent health care system, Mr. Speaker. It is part of our competitive advantage, and it will continue to be, Mr. Speaker. Well, Speaker, unlike this Premier, my value system does not include hallway medicine for the people of Ontario. My value system does not include that. People are being treated in hospital hallways because the Premier would rather hand money to her rich friends than invest in our hospitals. And if people think that it is bad now, Doug Ford's cuts and health care privatization will make things even worse. It's time, I think, to end the crisis that this Premier has created. And Doug Ford certainly is not the answers. answer. New Democrats will, in fact, end hallway medicine. And my question is, why did the Premier let things get so bad, Speaker? Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, let's let's talk about um, what we what we know uh, needs to happen at this point, Mr. Speaker. And I, you know, I I completely reject the notion that the leader of the third party puts forward that I don't believe that there's more investments that, that's needed, Mr. Speaker, or that it's acceptable for people to get. Um, care that's not adequate. And Mr. Speaker, we have made investments every single year in our health care system. And Mr. Speaker, what we are saying now is that there is more investment that is needed. Mr. Speaker, we've been very clear. I said uh, earlier $822 million. We know that's the, that's the uh, number that we have worked with the Ontario Hospital Association. That investment is in our budget, Mr. Speaker. But last year, there was a $500 million investment, Mr. Speaker, because we recognize that as the population ages, as the, uh, there are growth uh, parts of the province where there's more population and more need, we make sure that those parts of the province and that hospitals across yes, the province have what they need. Mr. Speaker, we recognize that there's more that needs to be done, but we have an excellent health care system. It is a competitive advantage, and it will continue to be. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, what's very clear is this government's been in office for 15 years, and look what we have as a result, a hallway medicine crisis. That's exactly what they ha we have. They had 15 years to deal with it, and they made things worse, Speaker. A health care system without hallway medicine is good for business. It's good for people. Health care is a basic that people should be able to expect from their government. But for 15 years, the Liberal government chose the West wealthy and the most profitable corporations instead of health care. We didn't have to end up here, Speaker, but there is hope. An NDP government will fix it. Will this Premier finally admit that she has created this health care crisis? Sure. Health and long-term care. Sure of health and long-term care. Mr. Speaker, it's two months since I became the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, and I have had the privilege of visiting health care facilities of all types across this province in the two months. And I can tell this House that Ontario should be proud of the health care system that we currently have. We know we have more to do. We are intent on improving uh, the system. But we have built a system that is doing an incredible job of keeping our loved ones safe, uh, healthy, and well. Our life expectancy for males and females is now at, um, at 65 is higher than the national average. It's one of the highest in the OECD. When we look at hospital deaths, cancer outcomes, avoidable deaths from health outcomes compared to other provinces, compared to other developed countries, we are in the top level of mm -hmm. health care systems. Wow. We have one of the lowest rate of potential Answer. years of life lost. I want to thank yet again all the health professionals across this province who are doing an amazing job thank you. to keep Ontarians yep. healthy yeah. and well. Yeah. Thank you. Your question, the member from Nepean Carlton. Good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. The Liberals were caught yesterday with a secret hidden ledger of the government's finances that proved that they have doubled their deficit overnight 
from $6.7 billion to $11.7 billion. Okay. The auditor was very clear that their sneaky way of budgeting is costing Ontario families over $100,000 if it's a family of four. That's $23,000 in debt now and over $26,000 per person in 2021. And a reminder, Speaker, that this is up from the $11,000 when they took office. Ontarians are telling us that they can't afford this Liberal government anymore with their waste and mismanagement and their massive distrust of this government because they do not feel there is value for their tax dollar. Will the Minister of Finance finally admit that the Emperor has no clothes and that that government has run Western. out of people's money? Uh, Mr. Speaker, again, we thank the Auditor General for the report, and we recognize that the Auditor General made very clear that all the assumptions the government put forward was cautious and were reasonable. Two items are, are in dispute between professional accountants, not with the government of Ontario, but with other accounting firms and, and a, professional accounts in the system. She's arguing has for some time that the pension assets should be amended, notwithstanding the fact that those very same principles have been adhered to for the past 20 years, Mr. Speaker. And on the second point, we are taking $1.5 billion off the tax base to support reductions in our reductions of electricity costs, especially for the rural communities. Then there's another proportionate amount that's coming yes, off sir. the rate base to amortize that asset. The Auditor General feels that shouldn't be done that way, yet every other rate-regulated system allows for it. <laughs> member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. Supplementary. The fact is there's only one auditor, and she said that your projections are not reasonable. She also said the perception is created that the government has more money than it actually does. There is only one auditor. And this is the government, let me remind you, that brought in the single largest sales tax increase in Ontario's history with the HST, brought in the single largest income tax history in the Ontario history with the, uh, it, with the health tax. They brought in the single largest environmental tax in the province with the eco tax only to be eclipsed with their cap and trade program. All along, these revenues have gone into the general revenue, not to specific programs, and yet they still have an 11 $0.7 billion deficit using other people's money. Speaker, Ontarians cannot afford the Liberals anymore, and they simply cannot trust them either. So will the finance minister stand in his place and tell us what else he is hiding in the books, or does Doug Ford have to come in and do it for him? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, now the member is questioning the auditor once again. Once again. The once fact once of the again. matter, the auditor has reaffirmed all the principles are operating appropriately, and all the accounting is, in fact, accurate. What is she saying is she would prefer that the rate fair hydro plan come off the tax base, not the rate base. We made a policy decision by government to support the ratepayers reduce the cost of electricity and amortize it over a longer period of time, which is allowed, Mr. Speaker, and it is provided by Deloitte, it's provided by KPNG and ENY. And the auditor goes further. The books of OPG, which is carrying this debt, she acknowledges that it's transparent, that it's there to be seen. She acknowledges that the clean audit by ENY is accurate, and she affirms that, Mr. Speaker, what's being hidden are the cuts that that member here, here, and her party are about to do to the people of Ontario. Absolutely. We're going to grow our economy and we're going to continue on our fiscal track to bow and make sure Ontario. Thank you. Stop the you see it, please? You see it, please? New question? The member from London, Fanshawe. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Carol contacted my office. She told us her husband is forced to live in long-term care because he can't get the care he needs, and she is concerned for his health. It is steadily deteriorating, but he is still not getting enough physiotherapy. His PSW can only help with him with his exercises if there is enough time left over after his basic care is completed. And with only six to eight minutes per session, that just never happens. Carol's husband needs more hands-on care. After 15 years in office, why has this Premier failed to legislate the minimum standard for hours of hands-on care that long-term care residents and people like Carol, Carol's husband desperately need? Thank you, Minister Premier. of Health and Long-Term Care. Health, long-term care. 
require our long-term care facilities to ensure that each individual patient in their care receives the appropriate level of support that they need. And uh, in particular, of course, uh, uh, we have continued to invest in long-term care. In our most recent budget, of course, we are investing an additional $300 million over three years to increase staffing in long-term care. This is driven by our analysis of the patient, uh, the clientele that are actually in long-term care facilities, Mr. Speaker. They are aging. They have complex conditions. It's a good thing, of course, that people are living longer. Our life expectancy has increased. We need to obviously address those conditions that go with aging, and we're doing this on an individual basis, on the analysis done by our LINs, in a, a thoroughly appropriate way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, Carol and her husband try to avoid long-term care, but they live in a rural area. Like so many rural Ontarians, they can't get the home care they need. They looked into retirement homes and assisted living to meet his needs, but at the cost of $8,000 per month, it's simply unaffordable. So he was forced to live in long-term care, and he could spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair because he's not getting the physio that he needs. It is simply unacceptable. It shouldn't have to be this way, and no one in Ontario should have to live like this. Why is this Premier left people like Carol's husband without the access to care that they need? Mr. Speaker, no one is admitted to a long-term care home unless they qualify for that degree of assistance. Uh, so I would uh, question the member opposite's uh, uh, premise of her question. In addition to the $300 million over three years, what this actually means that every long-term care home in the province will benefit from an additional registered nurse. This is part of our commitment to increasing the hours of care each resident receives to a provincial average of four hours per resident per day. This is based on an individual need for each individual patient, carefully assessed by uh, the long-term care facility staff. And so this is going to mean an additional 15 million hours of nursing personal support and therapeutic care for our loved ones living in long-term care. We will continue to remain responsive to the residents' individual uh, needs for care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the minister responsible for small business. Davenport is made up mostly of small businesses, and making sure that Ontario has a competitive business climate where businesses can grow and compete is important to me, and I know it's important for this government as well. From reducing the small business tax rate by 22 per cent to saving businesses millions by reducing red tape, the numbers don't lie. Ontario has created over 821,000 jobs since the recession, and our unemployment rate is the lowest it has been in almost two decades. But the summer season is fast approaching, and we have heard from some small business owners that they face some challenges when trying to hire young people. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us Question. what this government is doing to help lower costs for small businesses when hiring and retaining youth? Thank you. Minister responsible for small business. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Davenport uh, for the question this morning. Mr. Speaker, exactly two weeks ago, I had the pleasure to announce the Employment Young Talent and Incentive uh, with Minister Hunter, my riding of Peterborough. This is an investment of $124 million over three years that not only helps businesses hire and retain youth aged 50 to 19, but also provides an opportunity for local businesses to provide good jobs for young people like Amanda Gurney an employee at Morrell's of Peterborough that I shop at every week. Businesses that hire and retain young employees through the Employment Service and Youth Job Connection Program can receive up to $2,000. Mr. Speaker, we know that that's a smart investment. In fact, since the incentive officially launched in January, nearly 70 young people in my riding have been hired at various local businesses in my riding. Smart and strategic investments like these are what will ensure small businesses can continue to create good local jobs in every corner Answer. of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. 
So thank you, Minister, for your answer. It's clear that this government is committed to delivering results for our businesses and communities, that we are choosing to make strategic investments in programs that boost economic growth and help Ontario families. Because we know that cutting important programs and incentives would be the most irresponsible thing to do. Small businesses play an important role in my riding of Davenport and really, Speaker, across all communities in Ontario. And we're delivering on our commitments, like eliminating fees on government procurement opportunities and designating 33 percent of government procurement to small businesses. Mr. Speaker, this is only a fraction of what this government is doing and has done. Will the minister please tell us more about other initiatives the gov this government has taken to lower costs for small businesses? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, and I want to thank Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the uh, member from Davenport for the supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Those who believe in cutting corporate taxes will save small businesses money. We know that the only ones benefiting from big corporate tax cuts are big corporations. We're making smart investments that will actually save small business owners time and money. The world of business is changing. We're making sure that entrepreneurs and small business owners have the skills and tools to complete. We recently announced a $12 million of our Main Street digital initiative to help small businesses across Main Streets in Ontario compete and grow. Business can receive up to $2,500 in grants to help them with their digital transformation as they embrace new technology. Mr. Speaker, just yesterday, I had the opportunity to visit St. Catharines, Ontario with my good friend, the member, to take a stroll down St. Paul Street, the main street St. Catharines. And I couldn't believe it. Store to store, the small business, small business. They actually told me things are booming wow. uh, in St. Catharines today. Uh, they couldn't believe it. And then, Mr. Speaker, as I was finishing my tour, they said they don't understand the doom and gloom from the opposite side of us when business is booming in every part of Ontario, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Question, a member from Dufferin, a real, a real question now. My question is to the Premier. Last night, the government posted a news release announcing 17 new Justice of the Peace appointments. Moments later, the news release was deleted and removed from the archives. Why the secrecy? Mm. Thank you. Any general? General. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I appreciate the, the question. I, I will look into why the news release was removed. Uh, we have appointed uh, 17 new Justices of Peace. As the member opposite know, uh, know that we have a very uh, a strong uh, independent process to, to appoint uh, Justices of Peace through our Justices of Peace uh, uh, Advisory Committee, also known as uh, JPAC, which does uh, all the posting and interviews and recommendations independent um, of the government. Um, it may be that uh, uh, maybe that one or two people were not informed who've been who've been uh, uh, who've been uh, appointed as Justice of Peace, and that's why the release uh, was removed. But I undertake to get back to the member and get the reason behind it. Thank you. Supplementary. Or it may be that some of the people who were appointed have too close ties to the Liberal government. Oh. That might have been it. We know that, that might have been it. Stop clock. Come to order. Finish, please. Will the Premier today table those 17 Justice of the Peace appointees and let the people decide whether there is a connection that needs to be further explored? General. Um, um, uh, Speaker, I, I'm, I'm not surprised that the member opposite will go in that direction. I'm, I'm really assuming there is a there is a human error that's involved. I can assure the member, uh, as the Attorney General, I take my responsibility very, very seriously in, in, in appointing the most highest of the highest caliber of individuals to serve as our judges and justice of peace. These people are uh, a class act. I've, I've been actually at events with the with the with the judiciary with our uh, lawyers in our great province and one of the compliments i continue to hear is the quality and the caliber of individuals who serve as our judges and justice of peace we have an extremely strong independent process by which uh, judges and justices of peace are, are appointed uh, i can assure you i'm absolutely confident that this, when you will see those 17 names you will you will realize how, how competent they are I don't, know, I don't know what the technical reasons why the news release is down. I will make sure that news release is up as soon as possible. Thank, Thank you. you. New question. The member from Essex. Thanks. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, in 2012, the Liberal government suddenly and unilaterally decided to kill the highly successful slots at racetrack program. Since then, we have seen the destruction of a once vibrant horse racing and breeding industry that supplied 65,000 good rural jobs in Ontario. A couple of weeks ago, horse people and smaller tracks were blindsided again after the government announced that it had offered a long-term funding deal negotiated between the OLG, Ontario Racing, and the private for-profit Woodbine Entertainment Group. Speaker, why didn't the Premier properly consult horse people and smaller tracks on this deal that will determine the future of horse racing in Ontario for generations to come? Mr. Finance. Thank you for the question. It uh, gives me great pleasure to reaffirm what it is that we are doing in regards to the horse racing. Um, we have now concluded a $105 million 19-year uh, contract so to enable the, the horse racing industry to have funding. We're enhancing what's called the Enhancement to Horse Improvement Program, extended for year-over-year year by OMAFRA. We have a new Racetrack Sustainability and Innovation Fund of $6 million over three years to support those smaller tracks and expanded resources of revenue. And we have an additional funding arrangement supplement with the racetracks that may be experiencing financial shortfalls, which enables long-term decisions in the racing community. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, we're providing a new board, the Ontario Racing Board, which actually will oversee the funding improvements and enabling the service provider to be determined. On that board will be small tracks and horse people and horsemen, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that everyone is properly represented. Supplementary. Uh, speaker, the, the Minister of Finance's answer is exactly what we're concerned about. This is what the problem is. Speaker, when Greg Walling, the government special advisor on the horse rac racing industry, resigned last fall, he had a warning for the Premier. He said, quote, Beware of Woodbine's dominant position. In the proposed structures of administration, not only are they the player, they are the scorekeeper and the referee. The Premier ignored this warning and handed over a near monopoly control of horse racing to this private, for profit corporation. Not only that, she's forcing horse people and tracks to decide by May the 1st whether to sign off on this lopsided agreement. Speaker, will the Premier withdraw this arbitrary rush? deadline and take the time to listen to the concerns of horse people and smaller tracks in rural Ontario. Thank you. Minister Speaker, that's exactly what we're doing. We're ensuring that they have representation on the board. We're ensuring that their voices are heard. We're ensuring that there is no oversight or monopoly on one race track over another. We're giving them the opportunity so that they are enabling themselves to be heard and make the appropriate decisions to, to fund ongoing basis, Mr. Speaker. That is the purpose of having that oversight prior to giving the service provider the ability to make those changes. Furthermore, Woodbine has a declining receipt over time as the industry make, gets stronger. We need to support the small horse tracks. We need to support the horse people and the horsemen, and we have met with all of the both The, the reason why the minister didn't know I was standing is because he was not addressing the chair, as all members are supposed to do, both questions and answers. I'm always right, Bob. <laughs> My apologies. <clears throat> New question. The member from Beaches, East York. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Now, Speaker, we've been hearing a great deal of late about jobs, specifically manufacturing jobs, and Ontario's growing economy. And we all know that during the last recession, many countries lost manufacturing jobs. For example, between 2007 and 2010, the United States lost 2.3 million manufacturing jobs. And we also know that between 2007 and 2009, real manufacturing output in the U.S. fell by 10.3%. So in France and Britain and Australia, many countries, Speaker, including Canada, the, the, the story was similar. And with few exceptions, the global manufacturing sector was hit hard by the recession everywhere. Yet we know, Speaker, Ontario's economy has been adding jobs steadily for the last years and that in overall jobs, we've more than bounced back from this recession. Now, Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition calls our targeted investments in Ontario businesses corporate welfare, and he vows to, vows to cancel these programs. So, Speaker, my question, question is simple. 
Will the minister please tell us how our strategic investments in manufacturing has helped that sector? Thank you, Minister of Education and Minister of uh, Economic Development and Growth. Thanks very much, Speaker. I want to begin by thanking the member for Beaches East York for being such an extraordinary champion for the people that I know he's honoured to represent. Uh, he is right, Speaker. He is 100 per cent right. The province of Ontario, not unlike most other places around the world, was hit hard by the global economic recession about 10 years ago in 2008. Unfortunately, Speaker, the alternative version of events or facts that the opposition, particularly in recent weeks, has put forward to the people is simply, is simply not reflective of what took place. Uh, because the opposition likes to pretend that though millions of manufacturing jobs were lost south of the border and around the world, frankly, that what happened here in Ontario was unique, Speaker. Of course it wasn't. But here's what's critically important for the people of this province to know and understand, and I can assure you that they do. Our province has created more than 820,000 net new jobs over the last 10 years wow. since the depths of that recession. Speaker, the fact is also, since that recession, Ontario yes, manufacturing specifically, employment has increased by 40,000, and in the last year alone, we in this province have added more than 15,000 manufacturing jobs. Speaker, that's more than many of our other. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the minister, of course, for that incredible answer and his unwavering support for the manufacturing sector in Ontario. It's important to hear about the successes of our workers and our initiatives that this government is taking in these sectors. The manufacturing sector is diverse, something that we on this side of the aisle know very well, but I believe the opposition seems to forget. From the auto sector in Windsor, Oakville and beyond, to advanced manufacturing in Welland, or the steel sector in Sault Ste. Marie, and food processing, Speaker, in my own riding of Beaches East York, this government has ensured that the manufacturing sector continues to grow. And while instead the oppositions are trying to trick Ontario, worker, or trick Ontario workers and investors and our competitors into believing that our people are failing, we know, Speaker, that since the minister has just explained, we are actually adding manufacturing jobs across the province, and in fact, we are leaders in manufacturing employment. So, Speaker, will the minister tell us more about what this government is doing to ensure our manufacturing sector Thank you. remains strong? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member from Beaches for the follow-up question. I want to continue. I want to continue with the story I was telling a second ago. Since that 2008 recession, manufacturing jobs here in Ontario have increased by almost 11 percent. Speaker, we have delivered amongst the most competitive cor corporate income tax rate in Canada, which the United States is simply now catching up to. Speaker. And because our government is a very strong partner for all manufacturers, since 2004, Speaker, our government has announced over $2 billion in support specifically for Ontario manufacturers, helping to create and retain over 100,000 jobs in every corner of Ontario. The workers of this province and the employers of this province, Speaker, have been waiting to hear opposition parties that are prepared to stand up for them, Answer. fight for them, and be on their side. So far, Speaker, they have not heard that from either opposition party, but they have confidence that we will Thank continue you. to stand shoulder to shoulder with them. Thank, Thank you. Good question. The member from Sarnia-Lampton. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. It's a pleasure to be here. Premier. My question is to the Premier. Premier, residents in Sarnia-Lampton are concerned that their drinking water is being put at risk by the development of 12 industrial turbines along the Chatham-Kent St. Clair Township border. St. Clair Ten Township Council has determined that the Otter Creek wind turbine development just outside the township border is a potential threat to the area aquifer that many residents in St. Clair Township draw their water from. St. Clair Township is asking the protection of the private water well system in the municipality be included in the mandate of the Thames Sydenham Region Source Water Protection Committee. Premier, will you listen to the St. Clair Township Council and make sure these wells are protected from contamination? Good question. Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. For the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, Speaker. And, and, and with all concerns around wind turbines, and I understand the, the passion with which uh, uh, those who live in the area uh, have their concerns about wind turbines, but I, I will say, Speaker, that as with all wind turbine projects, uh, we take the concerns regarding the environment and human health exceptionally seriously. So. Let me say at the beginning that, that my ministry adheres to a very strict renewable energy approvals process. Uh, and I know, Speaker, that, uh, that uh, uh, you know, the members opposite in the PC party have never approved a single renewable energy project uh, ever. 
uh, that we speak of or never spoken in support of any of those here in this House. Our, our government is uh, committed to a cleaner, greener future, a reduction in the use of fossil fuels, Speaker. Answer. But we do take these concerns very seriously. I'll have more in a supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, uh, my question is back to the Premier again. Premier, the construction of the Otter Creek turbine project will involve deep pile driving into the same black shale that left 20 water wells in the Chatham Kent area producing nothing but murky brown liquid, and I know the minister uh, knows about this. The residents of St. Clair Township are understandably concerned. Your government has the opportunity to do the right thing, cancel this project before the aquifer that supplies the residents in St. Clair Township with water is put at risk of contamination. Premier, will your government do the right thing, cancel the Otter Creek turbine project today? Thank you. Minister. Well, Speaker, I'll start by reiterating what I said at the very outset, the site, that, uh, that our government takes these concerns, the concerns of residents in this area, uh, very seriously, and we take the environment and the impacts of these types of developments, the impacts to human health, very seriously as well. Uh, and again, you know, Speaker, any, pro any project as it goes forward, uh, any, uh, any renewable energy uh, project that moves forward goes through a very rigorous evaluation process by my ministry to make sure that uh, the health of, of uh, the residents in the area, the health of the environment is protected, and this project as well will undergo and is undergoing those procedures. Yes, sir. Speaker. Excellent. Thank you. New question, the member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, we both know outrageous hydro bills are the norm here in Ontario. To make matters worse, since the Liberals privatized hydro, the Hydro One CEO, Mayo Smith, is making over $6 million a year while people in this province struggle to pay their hydro bill, buy groceries, get prescription medicine, and go to the dentist. This Liberal government continues to stand behind Hydro One CEO, Mayo Smith. They think that his salary is reasonable. I think that is a disgrace, and so do the people of Ontario. Speaker. When will the Premier make the right decision and bring Hydro One back into public hands where it belongs and put a stop, put a stop to those ridiculous executive salaries? Thank you, Premier. Attorney General. Attorney General. Thank you very much, Speaker. I'm uh, glad to speak. Uh, I stand up and speak on behalf of the, the Minister of uh, Energy on this important issue. I think member opposite Speaker uh, uh, knows uh, that uh, uh, that we ha we are taking uh, every step possible to ensure that the that the hydro rates, uh, the electricity rates are coming down. Our fair hydro plan has resulted in a 25% decrease, decrease on average for all, uh, for all uh, residents across, and businesses and farms across the uh, province. And in fact, speaker, in, in rural and remote areas, that, that discount, that reduction is in some instances around 50%. These, these reductions are taking place by, because of the concerted effort that our government has made in making sure that, uh, uh, that, that we have an electric system that is, uh, uh, that is uh, affordable, but also, Speaker, a system that is uh, clean, that is a system that does not burn uh, burns coal like the way it used to under the government, under the previous gov Conservative and the NDP governments, but ensures that we have got a clean air, a clean, emission-free uh, system, which is uh, available to Ontarians at an affordable price. Thank you. Supplementary. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And back to the Premier. No CEO of Hydro One should be paid $6 million when people are struggling to pay their hydro bill. The NDP has tried to put a cap on public sector CEO salaries in the past many times to legislation. Unfortunately, this government, along with the PCs, voted against several pieces of legislation to cap public sector CEO salaries. Speaker, we know PCs are more interested in helping millionaires instead of the people that have to choose between paying their hydro bill or eating. When will the Premier start caring about the people struggling to pay their bills in this province instead of supporting millionaires, millionaires on Bay Street? Thank you. Thank you. Premier, uh, Speaker, the Premier is the only leader 
uh, in this province that has actually taken concrete steps to reduce electricity bills by 25 percent for all Ontarians, small businesses and farmers. NTP's uh, Speaker Hydro uh, pamph uh, pamphlet is short on details but long on hollow promises. Many of their promises rely on a vague, yet-to-be-determined expert panel uh, to be convened sometime in the future. That is not going to sell, uh, uh, save Ontarians a single penny on their bill speaker. And they're basing their calculations on pie-in-the-sky negotiations with the federal government. Speaker, the reality is, uh, reality is that these vague proposals don't make sense. Their biggest idea? Buying more than $4 billion worth of Hydro One shares will not take one cent off electricity bill. It will take zero cents off electricity bill, Speaker. All it does is send Answer. billions to the stock market, money that should be used for health care, education, and infrastructure. We don't agree with their plan. Thank you. Question, the member from Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. Minister, we're joined by people across this province, across Canada, and around the world in recognizing the day of mourning. Together we pause to remember those workers who have lost their lives or been injured on the job. They're our family, our friends, and our neighbors. We should honor their skill, dedication, and commitment by making sure all those who follow have safer workplaces. Minister, I believe everyone in this House agrees that safety should be the number one priority in every workplace and every, on every job site. One injury is one too many. Every Ontarian should be able to go to work confident they will return home safe and sound at the end of the day. Minister, can you please tell us what we are doing to improve workplace safety? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, and thank you to the member for this very important question, Speaker. The day of mourning is one of the most important days of the year for me as Minister of Labour, but I think for all members of this House, That's Speaker. Correct. And I hope members will take the opportunity to attend some of the services that will be held around the province, Speaker. As a Minister of Labour, anybody that's been the Minister of Labour will know, Speaker, the Minister gets notified each and every time that a worker is killed on the job in this, in this province, Speaker, or is seriously injured. It's the worst part of the job, and it never gets easier. But each time, Speaker, it reminds me of the most important part of our jobs here, making sure that, above all else, workers in this province are kept safe. Speaker. We brought forward mandatory health and safety training for all workers, including young workers, Speaker, those that are new to the workplace, strength and protections for temporary health workers through Bill 148, and we're improving the support we give to those who are injured Speaker, by improving WSIB benefits. Speaker, as a result of this, Ontario has become one of the safest places in the entire world in which it can work. Speaker, we should be proud of that progress, Speaker, but not satisfied for one minute. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. This morning, we all donned yellow and black ribbons to commemorate the Day of Mourning. I hope that we will all continue to wear them through the weekend. The black represents mourning and the yellow represents hope for a safer and brighter future, a future where there are no injuries and where everyone returns home safe at the end of every day. This weekend, people across this province will gather at ceremonies in their communities. Flags will be lowered to honour loved ones, co-workers and friends we've lost. No job is worth a life. No job is worth an injury. When it comes to health and safety, we all have a role to play. We all have a responsibility. Speaker, I'll be joining uh, the Ottawa District Labour Council of Vincent Massey Park this weekend for their ceremony. And through you to the minister, can the minister tell us how he will be commemorating this weekend, the day of mourning? Thank you, Minister. Speaker, thank you, and thank you to the member from Ottawa South. Speaker, this weekend I'll be joining Ontario families at uh, local day of mourning ceremonies, both in front of the WSIB speaker and also at home uh, in Oakville. I'd urge all members to do the same thing, Speaker. There's day of mourning ceremonies held around the provinces. You can go online to get the information, find where the ceremony is at, and join those, Speaker, in honouring all those who have been lost or injured on the job. Because, Speaker, I know workplace safety is not an issue that should be divided along party lines. I think we can all in this House agree that workplace deaths and injuries are tragic, they're unacceptable, and they're preventable, Speaker. We should all work together to make workplace safety a personal priority, to speak to your constituents, your families, and your friends. If we work together, Speaker, we can ensure our loved ones and our communities know their rights, 
and they understand how to protect Answer. themselves. If we all work together to change society's attitude, and we should not rest, Speaker, until safety is regarded as routine. Thank you. Same as the seatbelt in a car, Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Bruce Carroll South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. It's been almost five months since you said you would review and fix the Ontario Wildlife Damage Compensation Program. Yet today, farmers across Ontario continue to face huge livestock losses because the program you put in place isn't working. I've personally witnessed and written to you about the damage the predators have done to livestock of farmers like Wayne Cahill and my riding of Bruce Gray Owen Sound. You've heard from respected farm groups, municipalities, and individuals who wrote and spoke to you, urging you to fix this mess. Minister, why are you holding up farmers' compensation? Thank you, Minister of Rural Affairs. I want to thank the, uh, my friend, the honourable member, uh, for his question this morning. Indeed, uh, uh, when I had the opportunity to address the annual meeting, the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, uh, we made a commitment uh, uh, to look at the wildlife compensation program. Uh, I had the opportunity, as I do, uh, you know, visiting the back concessions in Ontario, uh, certainly in my riding of Peterborough. Uh, I've been in the field. I've seen the damage that's been done, uh, coyotes attacking calves and fishers attacking young lambs. So we uh, put a process uh, in place to do the review. Uh, we reached out to significantly the OFA, Christian Farmers of Ontario, National Farmers Union. We've uh, developed a, a consensus on a path forward. And we're going to start the implementation process, and part of that will be to train the evaluators of municipalities right across the province of Ontario so they have a standard skill set when they're going into the fields to ascertain yes, damage from predators. Okay. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Minister. Minister, you have over a year's worth of evidence and complaints about the Ontario Wildlife Damage Compensation Program. You know the program is failing and not achieving its intended goal. One in five claims for predation kills is rejected by your staff, 20 per cent. They don't visit the farm, they're not doing groundwork, and when farmers call the hotline to lodge a complaint, sadly, some of them have been hung up on. Your inaction is inexcusable. Our party, and specifically our ag critic for Haldeman Norfolk, pressed you for answers on the same question just last Christmas. Five months later, you're still holding up farmers' compensation. It's time for you, Minister, to get down to hard work and fix this mess. So I ask, when will you give farmers their entitled compensation? Thank you. Minister? Well, Mr. Speaker, contrary to the information that was just provided by the member there, we want to make sure that we have all our evaluators to have a consistent standard skill set right across the province of Ontario uh, to go in the field as I have, uh, to look at the, uh, the remains, the carcasses from predator um, issues within rural Ontario. We've consulted widely with Keith Curry of OFA, the National Farmers Union. It's interesting, their view is slightly different to the narrative that may be provided by the member here today, is they're very pleased, Mr. Speaker, with the progress that we're being made. We're looking at ways to actually increase compensation, particularly for those animals that have uh, unique uh, genetics uh, to make sure uh, farmers are compensated. There's a consensus building, and they've indicated to us that we're on the right path to get this resolved. There you go. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the Francophone community in East Toronto has been pushing for an Ecole Secondaire Francophone for over a decade. Recently, they learned that Conseil Scolaire Viamond has leased the former Greenwood School from the Toronto District School Board. Because of the small footprint of the existing building with no adjacent schoolyard, there's no green space for students. Parents are concerned that a lack of equivalence with English schools that have many acres of green space and better facilities will result in ongoing assimilation of the next generation That's of right. Francophone students. That's right. What will you do, Minister, to ensure that a fully equivalent Francophone high school with dedicated green spaces for the students is delivered to this community? Thank you. Come here. Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member opposite for this question. Our government is absolutely committed to supporting both French and English school boards across the province to build better schools. And in fact, since 2013, we have provided $208 million in capital funding to CSV Amon. In this time, CSV Amon has completed 25 projects, including eight new schools and 17 additions and retrofits. In fact, we recently announced this year we're providing $80 million, including 
more than $16 million to be invested in the Viamon School Board to support the creation of a new French high school in Toronto. This school will become the fourth public French language high school in Toronto, and it is, a, it is absolutely a very important move for the community and for, by the school board. Here. Thank you. The House Leader on a point of order. Point of order, Speaker. Thank you. Speaker, I want to inform the House that the, the announcement relating to Justice's piece will be uh, posted later uh, today. It uh, went up by mistake as opposed to just a uh, news release to announce an appointment of a regional senior uh, justice. Thank you. Well, that's actually not a point of order. I believe it was an answer to a question that could have been given later, but I appreciate the fact that the minister attempted to find an answer. The, I've got somebody else I have to recognize here, John. The uh, Minister of Transportation on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Today I'd like to welcome the family members of Paige Madeline Bus from Cambridge, who are sitting in the members' gallery this morning. Charlotte Bus, Stephen Bus, Graham Bus, and Jack Ruddle. Welcome to Queen's Park. <laughs> Good choice. We have a deferred vote on the motion of the third reading of Bill 3, an act respecting transparency of pay and employment. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
All members, please take your seats. All members, please take your seats. On April the 25th, 2018, Mr. Flynn moved third reading of Bill 3, an act respecting transparency of pay and employment. All those in favour of the motion, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Mr. Nackie. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. McMahon. Mr. McMahon. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Domino. Mr. Domino. Mr. Verniel. Mr. Verniel. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. Molly. Mrs. Molly. Madame De Rosie. Madame De Rosie. Mr. Codd. Mr. Codd. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Mrs. Wong. Mrs. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Mrs. Hogarth. Mrs. Hogarth. Mrs. Koala. Mrs. Koala. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Tab. Mr. Tab. Mr. Miller, Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller, Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. You're recognized by the clerk. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Ostrov. Mr. Ostrov. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Are 60, the nays are 15. The ayes being 60, the nays being 15, I declare the motion carried. The reading of the bill, troisième lecture du projet de loi. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.